The recreational use of plants with psychoactive properties has a long history among humans. But did you know, it does with animals too. Author of Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins, Oni Bagung takes me on a trip through the world of animal intoxication. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. One, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. So Micah Hanks brought your book to my attention and I thought, okay, I have to speak with him because I think it's such a great concept. And it's something I don't think about all the time and I don't think the average person would. So with that said, the book uh, that you've wrote and have out, and you've multiple books as well, not just one, but Drunk Flies and Stoned Dolphins, A Trip Through the World of Animal Intoxication. So enough said with that. Can you explain a little bit about the book, obviously with that type of title, and then what your background as well, please? Absolutely. So uh, first, uh, Chrissy, thank you for having me on. And I thank Brother Micah for the connection. And uh, as I, as we said, you know, behind the camera, I'm a little starstruck, because I'm an admirer of the debrief. I'm an admirer of well, I, I, I'm essentially a, a nerd, geek, whatever you want to, uh, to classify me as. So, but thanks again for, for having me on. Well, I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, I got my bachelor's and my master's at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, my master's is in biochemistry. My bachelor's is in general science. Uh, I couldn't commit. I took astronomy. I, I took computer science, biology, of course. I'm also a non-traditional student because after my undergrad degree, I started working. Uh, I used to be a high school teacher, high school and middle school teacher. Never again, <laughs> okay, for a couple of reasons. Middle schoolers, they are individually very nice. They're delightful. As a pack, it's different. It's a, it's a, a different story. And my hat's off to teachers who, who, who stay with that. Then I got a, a job as a biochemistry, tech, biochemistry technician at a medical school in Puerto Rico. And my mentors there kind of apparently, well, they saw something uh, in me, okay? And they kept kind of nudging, uh, I think you, we think you are good at what you do and whatnot, why don't you consider? So I always wanted to go to grad school, but I was married, I, I had two kids already, my wife helped. So <laughs> I, I, I also like telling dad jokes and stupid jokes and whatnot, so. Stupid jokes are great here. Oh, Feel uh, free to share you, anytime. <laughs> yeah, you should see me teaching. If I might digress for a second. Yeah, go for because, it. Uh, this is kind of my style when I'm teaching, for example. We are all conditioned to a few minutes of close attention followed by distractions. It happens to me. It happens to you. It happens to all of us. And my biggest class is a, a big group of 250 students. I have two of those every semester. When I see a significant fraction of the class, not quite there, if you know what I mean, I tell a dad joke, a silly dance, a, a stupid joke, I've dressed as Darth Vader uh, in class. Uh, uh, okay, I can send you pictures. I, I have yes, to you're going to have to send me pictures uh, uh, okay. I'm in now in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'll send it to you. But I reset their attention and they come back to me. Uh, and that's uh, something that, that I like to do. Anyway, at that time, I was 35 years old. Uh, I'm back in Puerto Rico doing uh, working and whatnot. And a recruiter from Cornell University came to, to my institution. They basically recruited me. They offered me a scholarship. And I told my wife, is freaking Cornell. <laughs> okay, so, and at 35, we moved to the mainland. And our youngest son, we have three children. Uh, our daughter, she's 31. Uh, and two boys, 24 and 20. Our youngest was born in Ithaca, New York. Okay, so, and so, and we are here. Six months uh, before my graduation from my PhD, I got offered my teaching position at Westchester University, and I've been here ever since. And even though we are a predominantly undergraduate institution, I, I am I'm able to do research, I, I do, I, I write books, and this brings us to the topic at hand. Okay? Yes. My own research uh, is with flatworms, planarians. They are like, I don't know, maybe like this, maybe a, uh, about a centimeter long, 
the type uh, that I work with, and I do neuropharmacology with them. They can get addicted to neuroactive drugs, just like we do. For example, you put nicotine in the water, right? Then you take the nicotine away, they go crazy as if they were in, in, in withdrawal. They start shaking, they swim like crazy. Some of them latch themselves at the bottom of the dish and they go like a cobra, going like that. Yeah. So, and we have translated some of that research in parallel to the neuropharmacological effects of drugs in vertebrates like us, all right? So when I started, when I got the writing bug, uh, popular science writing uh, bug, uh, I wrote, I've written three books, two of them prior to the current one of, uh, that we're discussing. And for this third one, it's a, a direct extension of my own research. Because, well, if, fl if flatworms can get addicted to nicotine, cocaine, alcohol, and whatnot, other animals should be able to. And I, knew, and I knew very little of that topic. Then I started researching it. Uh, and I geek, geek out <laughs> immensely because I found so many examples of animals that seek out psychoactive substances just like us. <laughs> okay, what are like, these animals? And I believe it's bugs as well. Yeah, insects, uh, for example, the, the planarians that I just uh, told you. And my favorite example of them all is probably one of the earlier ones in the books, koalas. <laughs> okay. Really? When I, yes. When I was researching the book, uh, one thing that I like to go as far back as I can, it preferably to the primary source. So, I am a biologist but at heart. I love evolution. You know that Darwin was going to get into the picture. So I started looking at some of his correspondence and Darwin was very prolific. Uh, he wrote to everyone and anyone uh, asking for information about animals and whatnot. And he came across a, a few letters of people who described how koalas, for example, the first settlers uh, in Australia, they would take a koala as a pet and they would notice that the koala would beg for, I don't know, beer. They will steal the tobacco pipes from the person and they will chew on the tobacco. Uh, okay, so to me, koala is like the Winnie the Pooh. Uh, can I say Winnie the Pooh here? <laughs> so it's, it, it's like a, a cute little bear, but it can get addicted to tobacco and drugs. Uh, it's okay, so, so crazy yeah it's mind blowing it's mind i see blowing. Pi i'm picturing in my head uh, a, a drunk koala bear and yes. yeah. <laughs> like it would be kind of cute at the same time but yeah it's funny and they're probably very docile i would imagine some of them are so uh, i mean it, they can be domesticated uh but that's another misconception they can be as nasty as the uh, as anything else too you also have, uh, I see here that you also say that dolphins pass around a blowfish to get intoxicated, yes. yeah. uh, kind of, or not intoxicated, to get high, kind of like how you would pass a pipe. So within the cannabis <laughs> uh, field. Kind of. So you're right. So why do they do this? And like, what, what makes dolphins want to do this as a community too, not just do it yeah, individually? That, that and why was, the blowfish? Yeah, yeah. but that, that was one of the most, some of the frustrating parts of writing that particular section of the book, because there's li very little research about it. Long story short, a few years back, there was a documentary crew who went underwater to film a dolphin pod, okay? And for years, people have described that dolphins, they play with puffer fish, okay? Which is the, well, they puff up as a defense mechanism. And many puffer fish, they uh, produce a toxin called tetrodotoxin, which is a, it's a really nasty one, right? Which is the main culprit for the deaths associated with the original sushi, fugu, uh, in traditional Japanese cuisine, oh. okay? Now, what they observed is that apparently the dolphin pod, the, the dolphins in the pod, they were playing with the puffer fish. They will nibble on it. They will not eat it, okay? They will nibble on it and pass it to the next one and the next one, and the next one. And the documentary filmmaker 
interpreted some of the behaviors. After that, they were swimming very slowly. They were apparently enamored with their reflection uh, in a mirror. So, but there's no pharmacological studies to see whether they are actually intoxicated. The only substance that's presumably psychoactive enough would be tetrodotoxin, which would kill a human in those uh, amounts, certainly. But dolphins are, are much bigger, and maybe their brain is wired up differently. We don't know. I, I certainly hope somebody's doing research with that. Uh, right yeah, now. what's the yeah, what's the benefits then of dolphins getting intoxicated or using psychedelics? Or what's the benefit of animal, any animal using that? Okay, so that that there's a, a few schools of thought that actually uh, propose that we learn about the pharmacology of nature by observing animals, all right? For example, coffee, my, my favorite psychoactive substance. Uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not alone in that, <laughs> in, in that uh, particularity. Legend says that many years ago, a goat herder observed that his goats were nibbling on a certain, the berries of a certain plant. And then uh, he observed that the goats started getting very jittery and jumping around and very active, excited. So coffee uh, was began, it began to be uh, consumed, all right? Many medicinal substances in nature have been discovered by the observation of people, of the animals that ingest a certain substance. For example, chimpanzees, gorillas, and other primates, they ingest certain plants to get rid of parasites. Okay, or to get rid of uh, fever, things like that. The, this particular idea is called pharmacognosy, which is the knowledge of pharmacological substances, usually from plants or fungi, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, and by observing animals, the proverbial snowfall, uh, snowball uh, began, and now we have an actual science of pharmacology. That's amazing. So when yeah. animals are using any of these substance, are they, do we use it for the same reasons? Let's say like, would we use it for parasites or are they totally two different functions? Because we obviously know that we use it recreationally and we can use it as a medicine when we're looking at psychedelics, but when we're looking at alcohol and anything, is there any comparisons between, you know, both animal kingdoms? Absolutely. Because the, the, the line between a medication a nutrient and a recreational substance, it's very blurred, okay? It depends on how much you take it and how sensitive you are, okay? For example, alcohol, you can use it medicinally, right? You get a scrape. Uh, yeah, I have a science tattoo too. Uh, we can talk nice. about it later. So uh, I'm a geek, I'm a, I'm a nerd. So uh, you can get it uh, alcohol in a scrape, for example, or you can uh, drink it, well, recreationally, or there's people like me who can get dizzy with a beer. Uh, uh, okay, so, so medicinal, recreational, or even nutritional, all right? Because one of the uh, in interesting hypotheses about that is the drunken monkey hypothesis, okay? Which actually expresses the idea that primates learn to acquire a taste of fermented fruits for nutritional purposes because alcohol, it's rich in calories. One of the things that they tell you when uh, they want you to go into a diet, well, avoid alcohol. It has a lot of calories and whatnot. But when you are nutritionally deprived in nature, a fermented fruit is gold uh, for you. Not only you get vitamins and, uh, and food and whatever, but it's rich in calories, all right? But we don't have to go to primates. Did you know <laughs> that when fruit flies, you know, the, the fruit flies, they, they like to get uh, eat fruits and whatnot. Male fruit flies, fruit flies, when they are deprived of female companionship, okay, they prefer fermented fruit as opposed to fresh fruit. <laughs> they, it, they, Don't we all when we're going through lonely spells? <laughs> at exactly, times? exactly. But who would have thought that flies are right. able to do that? Okay, so that would be kind of the uh, kind of recreational or and maybe why? 
why can i ask why that they nobody is it a conscious exactly. yeah is it conscious nobody like, knows exactly you know they, sometimes they people are lonely and then you know they're unfortunately or they're going through hard times they use substances yeah. so you know is that a is that a case that we're seeing that flies have feelings then well let's just put it this way sometimes i don't even know what i'm thinking let alone what somebody else is thinking let alone a fly uh, okay. Uh, sometimes we got, we gotta be careful about anthropomorphizing the feelings and whatnot. But what it's true is that we all share a common evolutionary ancestry. Okay. And for the longest time, people thought, well, animals have no mind, no feelings, and whatnot. And anyone who's ever had a dog or a cat as a pet, no, that's that's not true. Uh, yeah. Okay. Animals have feelings. Uh, no, they right? do. As, as far as uh, flies and whatnot, we don't know. The main idea is that when we as, uh, as animals, okay, not only uh, humans, but flies, dogs, dolphins even, uh, that the main idea is that when we try to gather the, for example, the nutritional or medicinal benefits of substances, we discovered psychoactive uh, effects as an accident, uh, for instance, uh, right? right? Because uh, one, of, for example, one of the courses that I teach at the university is uh, pharmacology for advanced biology students, and I tell them that any drug has the potential of being psychoactive. All right? Let's suppose that you get a, a mean headache, right? And you take Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen. Uh, you, you know, a, a, a normal mild painkiller, okay? That's psychoactive because as the headache goes away, your mood improves, right? I've never <laughs> thought of that. Yeah, that actually so, makes sense, and, yeah. And, and it's a benefit from that. So for years, uh, people knew, for example, uh, colloquially, uh, ancient peoples, when they had an infected wound, they would put like moldy bread on top of it, okay? And where does penicillin came from? Mold. Right. Uh, 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 okay, so, and it's fascinating how uh, it's, it's cool to imagine, right? Like 50,000 years ago, Neanderthals, uh, uh, okay? Who, who, who were humans, by the way. Let's uh, suppose uh, we have this imaginary scenario. They were cold. They, they wanted to, to start a fire. They needed kindling, kindling right? So imagine that the only dry leaves that they were able to find was marijuana, right? They started the fire. They huddled up in the, in the fire. They went, hey, <laughs> and it, it could have happened like that. But nobody wrote that, that, that history. Uh, I mean, but certainly somebody at some point in the human history noticed if we inhale the, the smoke, but from when we burn these leaves, we get happy. Right. Okay? And, and by the way, I have to, uh, I don't know, clarify that I tend to, to, to tell humorous, sto uh, funny stories about these type of things, but I'm not making fun of addiction or because it's, it, it's a very bad thing. I mean, people have suffered and everything, but if we can use humor to teach uh, something, that's kind of my intention. Uh, I think that's a really solid point. I think you made a good point there that, yeah, people are using substances for not positive reasons and there's a lot of trauma that goes around it. So I appreciate you even saying that because I think that's something for sure that has to be a disclaimer. Absolutely. But, and, 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 right. and I'm so, yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, uh, an addiction is a real disease. Okay? For sure it is. Uh, yeah. uh, some, some people say, no, it's a matter of modal. So what that's, I mean, no, uh, I mean, uh, no. Yeah, it's, it's true. I want to ask you Absolutely. about then the evolution, because I want to go back to primates. There's this conversation that I've heard that allegedly primates probably use psilocybin, AKA mushrooms or other words that we've used in, uh, or magic mushrooms and use those that help their evolution. Is that something that you've heard? Um, and if you've researched that, uh, and what's your thoughts yes, on I have. it? Yes, I have. That's another hypothesis that has, uh, uh, fewer uh, lines of evidence in favor of that. This one is called the stoned ape hypothesis. 
Okay. Right. This was formulated by probably the most uh, preeminent person in psychedelics, Terence McKenna. So uh, he actually proposed that he was thinking more in terms of the origins of consciousness. Okay. Which, in my view, presents a problem because we don't really know what consciousness is. Uh, right. Okay. And nobody really knows. No matter what they say, nobody really knows. We're trying. Well, yeah, we're trying. Yeah, absolutely. So the stone ape hypothesis proposes that our ancient uh, uh, ancestors, they consumed uh, psychedelic mushrooms for nutritional purposes, and they noticed some effects. Okay. And he goes further. He actually explores. I, I read some of his original writings. It's fascinating because he actually proposes a uh, a hypothetical plant or fungus, okay, that will have this characteristic, this characteristic, and so on and so forth. He found a candidate. Several types of uh, fungi that uh, grow on cow pies. Uh, uh, cow okay? pies. Yeah. So many jokes can be told about that, but uh, but again, we can joke about it, but. To a very hungry primate who knows that fungi could be edible, right? They see something like that, they will eat it. H hunger is the best condiment. Uh, so right. that, that's one thing. But can you imagine how many people had to die, uh, like try and, uh, trial and error, by because some fungi can kill you. <laughs> but if you don't know what you're doing, you can actually get poisoned by certain fungi and mushrooms and things like that, okay? Some of them are perfectly edible. It takes uh, know-how to tell the difference. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much the, the idea about the origins of consciousness and the stone ape hypothesis. Wow. And so when we look at evolution then, has there been other animals that have used psychedelics or alcohol to be intoxicated to help their evolution? And if so, what are they outside of potentially apes and humans? Uh, well, there's, as we go quote unquote down in the evolutionary uh, tree, we have less and less information. Okay. But in terms of psychedel psychedelic behavior, we know that, for example, going back to the experiments that I do in my own lab with flatworms, some people have done that with uh, octopuses, for example, okay? And uh, one of the things that I found that was very amusing to me, because uh, octopuses or octopi, uh, there's a kind of a controversy. I like octopi, it sounds cooler, but it's, that's beside the point. Uh, octopi are curmudgeons. They, they are not very social uh, animals. But when you give them ecstasy, the drug MDMA, they become mellower, okay? And that's a substance that they, first of all, is completely synthetic. They would not find that in a natural environment. Keeping going back uh, in the quote unquote, again, evolutionary uh, tree, there are some, for example, insects that consume, uh, let's say, uh, for example, the monarch butterflies, Right. They consume milkweed, and there's a specific type of toxins called cardenolites, to which the monarch butterflies and their uh, caterpillars are immune to. Okay, so they use that as a chemical defense against predators. All right, mm -hmm. going back to the flies that we uh, uh, talk about, certain types of flies, they prefer to deposit their eggs in fermented fruit when they become aware of parasitic wasps in their environment. Because when they deposit their eggs in the fermenting fruit, the alcohol protects the eggs from the parasitic flies. Wow. How did that evolve? <laughs> okay, so right? It's, it, it, it's crazy. And then uh, animals, they, they have learned over time Maybe it's not conscious. Maybe it's a conditioned response. We don't really know, but it's easy to it's very easy to imagine a very curious primate like ourselves, right? Observing well, well, the flies do this, or or the goats do that, all right? And well, there we here we are. Wow, 
What are the list of psychedelics and other types of drugs that they're using? Um, like let's say if coffee would be one all the way now, I, I've, you said things like psilocybin. And so what, what's the list? What's on the menu for uh, them? Pretty much anything that can affect us can affect uh, a fellow animal. For example, nicotine, uh, right? Uh, nicotine is one of my favorite drugs in terms of pharmacology. Uh, I'm not a smoker. I'm not judging either. But pharmacologically speaking, it's very interesting because it's a, there's essentially only one type of molecular target uh, in any animal uh, plant. It's one type. That's, it's a specific receptor. But then what's the advantage of a plant producing cocaine, nicotine, all right? They don't use that in their own metabolism at all. But they produce it ostensibly to either lure or defend themselves against insects. Originally, uh, many of the drugs that are abused by humans, uh, cocaine, nicotine, morphine, they are their original uh, evolutionary purpose, again, quote unquote, would be as the original insectic insecticides. Because for example, we have a tiny insect and it nibbles on a tobacco plant, that a small amount of nicotine, it's enough to kill the insect or deter it, okay? But in a much bigger human, we go again to the idea of dosage. Uh, in a much bigger human, you can actually smoke uh, tobacco and in the short term, it's not harmful, okay? It, it will give you certain sensations that some people uh, obtain uh, by that. Wow. So it's outside. Crazy. It it's is. Crazy. It's so cra It's so crazy. Yeah. Outside of the research that you're talking about now, what's the research that's currently happening around this topic? Well, there's a whole field of study, which is relatively recent. It's called chemical ecology, which essentially ties in all the ecological interactions of plants, animals, and fungi, okay, in light of their, of chemical advantages. Uh, all right. So, and, and that's kind of the main I don't know, synthesis of this type of ideas. And we keep observing animals uh, in nature uh, as much as we can uh, nowadays, at least. And ever since we learn how to do organic chemistry and, and biochemistry and whatnot, we can actually design medications based on chemicals that are found in nature. Wow. And that's beautiful because if we're not testing on animals and not having animal abuse, but we're using animals or using it in their natural environment, it's a way to observe them consuming in natural environment, how it affects them and then how it might affect us. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's beautiful. And I think that's probably the way that you should be looking at doing research. It's organic and it's, it's truthful in my perspective. It's interesting. I, I love it. We have multiple different drugs and all different types of things that can make people intoxicated. What has animals discovered for us when it comes to drugs and alcohol? Okay, so one of them would be, for example, caffeine, all right? And it's not historical, but just to give you another example, uh, you know, uh, wallabies, which are, uh, I, I know I'm, I'm saying like a zoological heresy, but to me, wallabies are like mini kangaroos, uh, something like that. Some wallaby species, they actually raid poppy plantations, uh, even when they have food available uh, elsewhere. So they write, raid the plantations and they get those psychoactive effects. This probably is, is not historical. They found that after the fact, and that has been documented, okay? So pretty much any type of substance that we can con consume, very likely we learn from animals, okay? And uh, trial and error too, and basically hunger, basically hunger. Have we decided that maybe animals have discovered things like ayahuasca? Is that even a conversation? You know, I know that's that's very much in the psychedelic and it's a brew that's created, but was, were animals part of that? Because are, are they pointing humans towards directions of psychedelics that they should be using as we're obviously watching them in the animal kingdom? Um, are we seeing that more? And would ayahuasca even be one of them? Yeah, but my unqualified answer, okay? Uh, it's, it's a yes, okay? Okay. Because there's documentation that they have seen jaguars in South America 
like scraping the tree bark of the same plants from where ayahuasca is uh, isolated. Right. And they look for all intents and purposes high as if they were in catnip, on catnip. Okay, so it is entirely plausible in my view that South American natives thousands of years ago observed a jaguar, you know, nibbling on a plant. Why would a, a predator will nib, nibble on a plant? And they, it will look, it, it will behave differently. And that probably gave South American uh, natives the idea, well, if we eat that plant, will we get high too? Okay, so, and that's again, my unqualified, I, I'm not personally engaged in that research, but it's entirely plausible by me, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it seems like it would be possible and plausible. So here's a question then, and you might know this or not, but if we look at people, when we look at people using ayahuasca and we see that they have these psychedelic trips that happened and they have messages or they have experiences, we should say, are animals, are we able to research that animals are having something similar, but in their own world? Have we well, seen that with psychedelics? Even just outside of ayahuasca, we have DMT, we have multiple mm -hmm. different psychedelics. Yeah. No, have we no, looked at animals no, consuming them and what happens to them within their own consciousness? Can we even measure that? We can, uh, uh, my, my feeling is that we can infer meaning, for example, not exactly with psychedelics, but certain uh, chimpanzees uh, tribes they have been found to, for example, construct, construct mounds of rocks. And it seems to be very important for them. All right. And they, they can even, uh, I read somewhere that they can even put rocks inside the hole on, of a tree trunk. And it, for some reason, is very important for them. Okay. Let's put a pin on that uh, for a second. That could tell us, for example, that maybe chimpanzees will have a rich mental, uh, a rich set of mental images. And it is possible that if we give hallucinogens or psych psychedelics to primates like, like chimpanzees, they may experience something that it's very similar to what people commonly describe as psychedelic experience. I have never experienced anything like that, but it's not uh, out of the realm of possibility. The more similar they are to us, the more likely is that they will express similar uh, effects, okay? That reminds me, maybe we can uh, get a, a koala high on psilocybin, who knows, okay? And what, what would a koala hallucinate about? I, so, I wonder. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the most, some of the most interesting questions, sadly, they don't have a, a clear cut answer. I just see it. Uh, that's the, the my main pet peeve about it. But you know, we'll we're learning. Well, maybe we'll connect a neuro link to a koala and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> when it's consuming some type of uh drug and, and we'll see it hopefully in, in its own choice to do that, obviously. And maybe we'll yep. connect a neuro link and see what happens. But it's unbelievable. I now will look at flies differently when they land on any type of fruit that is aging uh, or fermenting now. <laughs> and wonder if they're lonely. Uh, yep. So now I will always, I'm kind to animals and to bugs. I try to shoo them out and not kill them. Uh, yeah, I always joke around with that. a friend saying we, none of us like flies, but now I have a totally different outlook for flies. <laughs> That's for sure. I, especially if it's a male fly, I don't want him to be lonely or a female too. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody can get lonely. And I'm, I'm, I'm just like you, I'm the kind of person who see a, an earthworm uh, on the sidewalk and I pick it up and put it in the, on the earth. Uh, so yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a great outlook as well. Thank you so much. And as I say to everybody, One, thank you so much for being rebelliously curious with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And, and again, I'm always available to geek out and talk science uh, with you. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> <laughs>